Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ticked Off, Making Sense of the Lyme Disease Controversy. I'm Ted Canova, Managing Director for WGBH News. We want to thank you all for coming out today. We are streaming this online, and um, thankfully, our partners at New England Center for Investigative Reporting were largely behind this event, so we appreciate you RSVPing and being on hand. We also like to send out a special thank you to our sustained members. They are the ones that really make events like this possible, and also a lot of what WGBH News does. Along with our partners at New England Center for Investigative Reporting, part of our mission, as you may know, is to bring local depth and local perspective to important issues, and I think tonight we're going to get a lot of depth and a lot of perspective from noted journalists and also um, really distinguished experts. A few housekeeping things before we start. Um, we're recording this event, as I said, it is available online, we just want you to know that. Uh, if you have a question, please write it down on a card that you've either received or can get from an usher. Uh, raise your hand and somebody will collect it and we'll get it to the panel. Also, afterwards, we're going to have a reception in the atrium. We'd love to talk with you, mingle. You can talk with our journalists and our experts also. And if you're tech savvy on Twitter, the hashtag is Lyme Disease. And uh, Heather, our moderator, will also be looking at Twitter throughout the night, so you can do that. So in the next half hour, in the next hour, we're going to be um, hearing from everybody on something that's really scientific, but as many of you know, it's also extremely personal. How personal? I'd like to share an email I received from a loved one. For a few months, I've been having increasingly severe joint pain. One day it will be in the knees, another in the elbows, then wrist, then knee, and wrist, then shoulder near the collarbone and knee. Then, well, you get it. It moves around, hits different joints, oftentimes in combination, and even moves around within the joint. It's been getting worse, more and more painful, and beginning to limit my mobility. Today I woke up with right wrist in severe pain and hardly able to move it, like it's broken, but it's not. And my right collarbone also hurts a lot, and the top of the left wrist, and at some point in bed this morning, I lost feeling in my left hand. So I started thinking it was Lyme disease, since migratory joint pain is a big symptom of that. But I don't have other Lyme disease symptoms. I did some research. Primary causes of my symptoms now appear to be rheumatoid arthritis or lupus disease, both of which can become very debilitating. The other day, I had a soft, puffy pouch on my left elbow that seemed like water on the knee type stuff. Incredibly, I'm now hoping it's Lyme disease in view of what I've been reading about the other possibilities. Why me? Why now? Kind of confusing, especially when you read this from a loved one, a family member. This was two years ago, and it took uh, many, many months for him to overcome this. Uh, thankfully, we believe he has. It's also aggravating, and like the title of this forum is Ticked Off. So, there's a lot to go through. Hopefully, we'll make sense of a lot of this. Your questions will add to this, and obviously, the spirited conversation will also. Partnerships are a big thing of what we do at WGBH News. You may hear it on the radio, you see it on TV, you see it online, and one of our greatest partners is the New England Center for Investigative Reporting. Joe Bergantino is the executive director, managing editor, and the co-founder of New England Center for Investigative Reporting, and he's also my friend, and he's here to get this thing going. Thank you. Good evening and thanks for being here. Um, the idea for this event tonight began last June when our reporter, health and science reporter Beth Daly, did a story that raised serious questions about many of the tests that are being used to detect Lyme disease. Uh, that story went viral and we came up with the idea for the event because we knew this was a, a, a major topic of discussion here and around the country. That's what the New England Center for Investigative Reporting does. We launched in 2009 with a mission, a dual mission, to do serious investigative journalism and also to train a new generation of investigative reporters. And in the five and a half years we've been around, we've done about 65 investigative stories and we've trained hundreds of, of high school students, college students, and journalists in this country and around the world how to do investigative reporting. We have a terrific partnership, as Ted mentioned, with WGBH, a partnership that benefits you. We're here to do investigative reporting with the staff of WGBH. You hear it on the radio, you watch it on television. It's an important part of what we do. It's an important part of what we do for, for you 
here in New England and also around the country. So um, you can learn more about our center. Uh, we have a table outside uh, in the lobby. If you want to sign up for, for updates on what, our, what we do on a regular basis, please uh, leave your email address there. And, uh, and our reporter, Jennifer McKim, will be uh, talking to you about uh, more of what our center does and what we're doing in the next uh, few months, actually. Another story about a laboratory-developed test that uh, Beth Daly is working on that uh, we'll be launching in the next couple of weeks, actually. We have a very distinguished panel here tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce them one by one. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, ben, uh, if I can put my glasses on, I'll be able to read this. Um, uh, Dr. Ben Beard, who coordinates the programs on Lyme disease for the Centers for Disease Control. If you want to go up there and take a seat, uh, that'd be great. Beth Daly, as I mentioned, who is our health and science reporter at the New England Center for Investigative Reporting. Before joining us last fall, she spent two decades at the Boston Globe. We have Heather Goldstone, who is the moderator tonight. She is a science editor here at WGBH News. She holds a PhD in ocean science and Dr. Andrew Onderdonk is Professor of Pathology at the Harvard Medical School. We're going to start the discussion tonight by showing you a snippet of a TV piece that aired last June uh, based on the story that Beth did uh, that summarizes her findings and hopefully will spark the discussion tonight. Thank you. It's the season to get outdoors in New England, and unfortunately, that also means it's Lyme disease season. A recent federal study found there are roughly 3.4 million Lyme tests conducted in the U.S. each year. But how accurate are they? Our partners at the New England Center for Investigative Reporting found some labs may be incorrectly diagnosing patients with unproven tests. WGBH News reporter Rupa Shinoy has the story. On a beautiful fall day in 2010, Brandy Dean was watching her husband play soccer on a field near some woods. That's when she thinks she was bitten by a tick. I got really sick. I um, had severe panic attacks. I had swollen lymph nodes. I had muscle spasms, um, dizziness. I was losing my hearing. Dean thought she might have Lyme. Her doctors gave her one of the federally recommended tests for the disease. I had three positive validated tests and several doctors totally disregarded my positive tests. That's because doctors consider their federally recommended Lyme tests unreliable. Since Dean didn't have the telltale sign of Lyme, a rash that looks like a bullseye, she was told she probably didn't have the disease. It was awful. I just felt ignored, completely ignored by the medical community. Dean ultimately found a doctor willing to treat her for Lyme, but other patients with uncertain test results aren't so lucky, leaving them frustrated and miserable. I understand why people would, who may have gone to their primary care physician and been tested by the traditional method who are negative are desperate to try to be diagnosed. Andrew Onderdonk speaks from experience. The Harvard pathology professor was diagnosed with Lyme disease in 2012 using one of the federally recommended tests. In my case it was easy because I was I was had such a positive test result that it wasn't ever an issue. I probably would have sought a additional test for Lyme disease if I thought that's what I had. Some frustrated patients seek out doctors willing to use tests that haven't gone through a full federal review. Those unvalidated tests can be even less reliable than the recommended tests. Many of these, because they have not been validated properly, uh, may either misdiagnose someone as having disease that they don't or alternatively not diagnose somebody who in fact has an infection. Certain labs sell their Lyme tests without federal review because of a loophole created in the 1970s. And they're making money on it and they don't really want to go through the expense of going through a true validation. New York is the only state that reviews diagnostic tests to make sure they work, and officials there have blocked seven U.S. labs from selling Lyme tests in the last decade. They include one company cited for quote-unquote substandard scientific practices and another owned by a man convicted in a medical research fraud case. Both labs tell NECIR they stand by their tests. But Onderdonk says doctors who use unvalidated tests are in danger of misdiagnosing their patients. And it's hard, I think, for any professional to say, listen, I don't know what's causing your symptoms, but 
being treated for Lyme disease may be harmful. Brandy Dean is finishing the antibiotic treatment that alleviated her symptoms, and she now runs a support group for Lyme patients. I don't think any of us have any confidence in the tests that are available to us now, um, which is very unfortunate because I think once you are able to diagnose the illness, then um, you know you can help treat these people who are very sick. Until then, Dean says there will be more stories like hers. Rupa Shinoy, WGBH News. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Heather Goldstone. I think that uh, gives us a little bit of a starting off place. Thank you to, to Joe and to Ted for setting things up. Um, I actually want to start with a question for you, and that is how many people here have had Lyme disease or had a family member, a loved one with Lyme disease? Wow, almost everyone in the room. And as all of you, I'm sure, know, this can be an emotional and frustrating uh, and controversial on a larger scale uh, issue, and that is definitely what we want to talk about this evening, uh, keeping in mind that, of course, we want to keep this civil and productive. So. Um, air your frustrations and your questions, but please don't do so in a, a polite way. You have the, the papers where you can uh, put, place your uh, questions, and as Ted mentioned, we have the Lyme disease hashtag that you can also use. Um, you know, no, no booing, no cheering, um, but let's, let's have a, a lively and, and productive uh, discussion. The way I want to start things off is actually asking each of our panelists to Tell us a little bit about uh, why it is that, that you're ending up sitting up here. And, and Beth Daly, starting with you, what is it that, that originally drew you to the, the Lyme disease story? Yeah, so I was a science writer at the Boston Globe and taking a year off to go back to school. And I was living in California. And um, uh, in April, two and a half years ago, my husband and I got, a, I got an awful call. Um, his first cousin and um, his best friend's wife had uh, taken her own life very unexpectedly. I left behind two great kids, and um, the cause was uh, Lyme disease, in, in her opinion. Andrea was this dynamic person in Northampton, Massachusetts. She was the glue that held the community together in many ways. She was a teacher. She would bicycle up Mount Washington for fun. That was her idea of a good time. <laughs> the overachiever, you would never know. But suddenly, to about three and a half to four years ago, she got suddenly sick. She became listless. When I saw her at Christmas, the following Christmas, she, she looked at me kind of perplexed and said, you know, I, I drove the kids to soccer, but then I couldn't remember how to drive home. Her brain was foggy. She had to quit her job teaching. She got stuck on the couch and could never get up again. And when I got back from California, I went back to the Boston Globe, and now at NECIR, I've always had this question about Lyme disease, and I'd always thought it was just so, sort of this little minor public health annoyance in New England. You get bit, you get antibiotics, and that's it. But um, very quickly I learned when I came back to the globe, uh, I began looking into Lyme disease and found out virtually every single piece of it is controversial, particularly testing and particularly treatment. And um, it's a very emotional issue because a lot of patients are sick, everyone knows they're sick, um, and they go to doctors and the doctors tell them they don't know what they have and they send them often to psychiatrists because many are depressed and they think the doctors said they can treat them for depression, which obviously would come from being sick. Um, and patients get feel uh, sort of pushed aside and very angry about that. Um, so it, it is a very emotional topic, I found, and I've been really looking at it on and off for about a year and a half now, most recently with testing, which we'll talk a lot about. Andy Onderdunk, you are a professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School, uh, director of clinical microbiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, but Lyme disease is not your professional uh, specialty, per se. Uh, you actually have a, a very personal connection, which is your own Lyme disease story. Interestingly, uh, earlier in my career as a scientist, I actually helped develop one of the first enzyme immunoassays that was used to diagnose Lyme disease in collaboration with some of my colleagues. Uh, more recently, um, Beth approached me to tell my own story about Lyme disease, which uh, probably started in May or June of 2012 with a tick bite. I never developed a rash or any of the classic symptoms. And mind you, I'm a clinical microbiologist and know a fair amount about the disease. I never suspected a thing until I awoke one morning in November of 2012 with a, a terrible pain in my right hip that uh, did not go away after a day or two and lots of ibuprofen. 
And so I decided to go to my primary care physician and ask to be tested for Lyme disease because of where I live and the fact that my wife also has had a couple of um, bouts with acute Lyme disease as well. So we know it's in, in our area. Uh, I tested positive, was treated with the traditional doxycycline for a couple of weeks, which didn't make anything better. And uh, in retrospect, I should have realized at the time that I had been infected for probably six or seven months before the first diagnosis was made. And so uh, the disease progressed from a pain in my hip to an infection of the nerves in my lower spine, which I will tell you was the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, I was fortunate to seek treatment, uh, was given IV antibiotics for a month, and uh, that I think cleared the, the organisms from my system, but it's been probably another six months before things got back to baseline. And so it's a, it's a very personal experience, it's a painful experience. I can understand anybody who's in that kind of severe pain just wanting to seek uh, information about what's causing it and trying to get treated. It's, I absolutely understand it. And uh, Ben Beard, our final panelist, uh, Chief of the Bacterial Diseases Branch at the Centers for Disease Control, where you've been since uh, 2003. Also uh, coordinate the CDC's program, uh, excuse me, the uh, director, Associate Director for Climate Change uh, for the CDC, which we will touch on a little bit later, way to combine two hot button issues <laughs> under, uh, under one umbrella. But uh, I, I wonder if you could give us a sense from your perspective of, of where some of this controversy comes from and, and where some of the uh, obstacles and opportunities are. Sure, uh, thanks Heather. So as I'm sure most of you know, Lyme disease is a spirochetal disease, it's transmitted by ticks. And uh, you know, in 2013, there were over 36,000 cases reported here in the United States. And, and actually over 5,000 of those cases were reported here in the state of Massachusetts, according to the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And um, we, uh, we've known for many years that, that this national number is underreported. Uh, if you're a physician you know, living here in, in Boston, for example, uh, and it's the fifth case of Lyme disease you've seen that week, you're probably wondering why should I take the time to fill out a long case report form and, and report this to the county health department who reports it to the state, reports it to CDC, and everyone knows Lyme is here. So you know, what's the benefit? <clears throat> and so these are some of the reasons why it's underreported. Uh, we've been looking more closely at that in the last few years and recently uh, published an article on the burden of illness, estimating that actually closer to 300,000 cases of Lyme disease occur each year in the United States. And um, so, you know, that's uh, it's a huge public health problem. And we also recently published a, a small number of, uh, but very alarming, uh, observation of Lyme carditis deaths that occurred in the last few years. And so, you know, it's a, it's a huge concern to us. Um, we're also, some of the other concerns we have are that the current diagnostics for Lyme disease are less than optimal in the early uh, stages of disease, and that's because Lyme disease test, the ones that are, are um, approved for use right now by the FDA, are all serologic tests, meaning that they detect antibodies to Lyme, so you have to be infected for, you know, usually four to six weeks before you have a response that's detectable. So that means in early illness, uh, typically the serologic test is, is negative. Uh, so that's an issue, and I can talk more about that later, what we're doing about that. Um, also, uh, following the withdrawal of the vaccine in 2002, really, uh, there's no validated prevention method that's available for Lyme disease. We know that we can kill ticks. We know that we can reduce deer populations. We know that we can, um, uh, you know, in many ways, lower people's exposure to ticks. But there's um, not a connection necessarily between that and a reduction in human illness. And a lot of times people don't know that they've been exposed to a tech. And so uh, this is a huge issue to us. And um, also we've known for quite a few years that a subset of Lyme disease patients, uh, typically those that are diagnosed later in illness, um, go on to uh, have persistent symptoms that can be very debilitating. And so for us, one of the most important uh, issues facing the field of Lyme disease is understanding what is the cause or causes of persistent symptoms in patients who have been diagnosed and treated for Lyme disease and what is the most safe and effective uh, treatment for that. 
So, um, so we have a four-part strategic plan that we've developed, and I, I won't go into the details of that right now, but, it, but really in, in brief, it's about uh, strengthening surveillance and our understanding of the disease burden, uh, identifying, validating what prevention and control methods actually work can reduce human illness, improving early and accurate diagnosis and treatment. Uh, because if you hear, you know, the more Lyme disease stories I hear, uh, I often hear if I'd just been detected early and treated, you know, rather than it go on for, for weeks or months, you know, it would have been much more easily manageable. And so that's, that's no argument. So uh, to be able to work with, with healthcare providers so that they recognize Lyme disease cases, diagnose them correctly, clinically, and treat them accurately is hugely important. And then finally, uh, we see ourselves as a lead federal prevention agency, but we realize we're never gonna be in your backyard uh, spraying for ticks and things like that. So for us, it's hugely important to build working relationships. And um, I have a couple of sayings that I always uh, go back to on Lyme disease. Uh, first is the goal is to generate light, not heat. And uh, so I'm welcome to participate in events like this tonight. And the second statement I always say is no one wins the Lyme war. And uh, you know it's really true, and I think there's a lot of common ground across this controversy, and prevention is one of those. And so, um, so I'll uh, I'll stop with that. Well, we can all go home now. No, <laughs> you've hit on all the bases there. But uh, you mentioned never being in the backyard spraying for for ticks, and I think that Beth, you touched on this as well. The fact that uh, for a lot of us who live around here. Lyme seems to be a, a fact of life, but for a lot of people, it's nowhere on their radar. And in fact, mosquito-borne illnesses are much more uh, publicly worried about and, and much more of a, a source of concern. Beth, in any of your reporting, have you been able to figure out why it is that, that we have kind of this, this gap or lack of awareness about Lyme? Yeah, no, I think, it's, I, I think people are aware Lyme disease is, but what, what hasn't followed is a public health response that's any that's meaningful at all, in my opinion, in my reporting. Um, so in Massachusetts, for example, we spend millions of dollars. In fact, across the Northeast, we spend millions of dollars for West Nile virus, Triple E, right? These are these are threats. Um, but if you look at sort of the disease burden and where it's spread out, and and, and sort of the the economic costs, Lyme disease costs um, to to the public, you realize that it's completely. There's no pre, there's no prevention method going on for ticks. Now this is for possibly a good reason. It's quite hard to prevent um, ticks. For mosquitoes, you can spray for them, right? You know you know how to do it. You close your windows and they do that. And it, it really has a good response. But protecting against ticks is, is, is far more difficult. They tend to be clustered geographically. Um, it's not entirely clear how to eradicate them on a widespread basis. But I was looking at last night, actually, at some statistics about how much we're spending on uh, tick prevention in the Northeast, and anyone want to take a guess what it is? Like, it's like $60,000 or something. I, I forget the exact amount, but it's, it's hardly anything, so. And Beard, are there prevention methods out there that could be more widely utilized? Yeah, um, I, I'll comment on that if I could say something to add on to yeah, what absolutely. Beth said. I think um, that, that's actually always really intrigued me because um, you know, all across the country, there are mosquito control districts and these have a very rich history here in the U.S., um, but, but how many tick control districts are there? <laughs> and um, tick control has traditionally fallen, uh, the burden of it has fallen on the back of homeowners uh, for preventing uh, exposure in your backyard. And there's good evidence that a lot of people are exposed in their backyard. But, um, you know, it's, it, the reality, though, is controlling ticks in your backyard because we live in subdivisions and neighborhoods and deer are moving through corridors and, and the pyramiscus, the, the, the mice that are reservoirs and chipmunks for Lyme disease, they're moving between properties. And, and um, if you control ticks on your yard in your yard and your neighbor doesn't, then, um, and your children are going back and forth and your pets are going back and forth, then um, you know it's just not going to be effective, and so I think you have to look at this more from a community level, and uh, when you, when you approach tick control in general, and it's going to take um, communities of practice and groups of people at local levels that are working together, not just individual homeowners, uh, to to reduce risk. So some of the things we do, and we've got uh, these resources at our website at www.cdc.gov/lime. 
And if you go there, we have a web page that's devoted to prevention. But the things that we talk about typically are to, um, to wear repellents when you're outdoors in tick infested areas, um, to uh, do tick checks when you come back in from outdoors, uh, to shower after you've been out in areas where you, you may have been exposed to ticks because a lot of times you don't see ticks on you, but, but uh, frequently they don't bite immediately. They'll crawl around and so if you can wash those off, uh, that's really beneficial. And of course, the, the last one is if you get a fever or rash, be sure to uh, contact your uh, healthcare provider. And um, in addition to that, we've got a lot of guidance on landscape management in your yard, how to uh, situate your property, put, to put zones, tick-free zones around the edge of your yard, uh, to put the children's play uh, equipment, you know, kind of in the grass and not back on the border if you have properties that are wooded and uh, things like that. And uh, so those are the things that we emphasize mostly. Andy Underdog, I think another part of this is of course, the, the diagnosis and navigating the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. As someone who studies infectious diseases, you have perhaps an expert leg up on many people. How did, how did you navigate that system and what how did your diagnosis go? Well, for, for me, it, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, I suspected because of where I live and at least the pain in my hip, that Lyme disease was certainly something I wanted to at least rule out. I mean, I could, you know, I'm old enough, so it could have just been arthritis or something like that. But I, I did what I would think most people would do. I went to my primary care physician and asked to be tested, which she agreed to. And so I had blood drawn and went to the local hospital and went through the routine FDA approved test. I probably, you know, I'd had it for four or five months. So as Ben pointed out early on, you know, you may not have antibody, which is what these tests, you know, depend on. And, but I'd been infected long enough so that the preliminary screen that they do came back positive. And then the second test they do, which is called a Western blot, came back. And I think um, I lit up virtually every band on the Western blot, uh, I was told. So, so my diagnosis was easy, but for other people, uh, if they get bitten by a tick or they get a rash, they don't know how long they've had that bite. And so they go and they get tested and it's negative and then they get frustrated. But what they should do is go back and get, you know, I, I would think, and ask to be retested, insist they be retested. Because I think that, as has been pointed out, it takes about four to six weeks for enough antibody to be there for these tests to go positive. And if you're tested earlier than that, it may be positive. I mean, some people make antibody very early that's detected, but some people don't. And those are the people who are at risk, I believe, if they don't get retested. Go ahead, Ben. I had something to add on to that. I mean, I think in many ways that you, you are a classic case of, of everything gone right, right? I mean, you had it, you didn't know about it. But I think. Well, it, I would argue that I wish it hadn't been. No, right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But, it was no but, fun. <laughs> but talking to many, many people, including Brandy yeah. Dean, the woman who actually tested CDC positive, and was di her, her diagnosis was dismissed by her doctor. Um, I looked, talked at her medical records at the time. Um, is that I think a lot of lay people go to the doctors, and I think these days a lot of doctors, um, and I'm realizing I'm casting this as a broad stroke, but I've talked to enough of them, feel like the Lyme disease has become such a controversial flashpoint that they're, they're, they're less, they appear less willing to take a patient's word that they got were bitten by a tick bite. They want to see the rash. They want to see like a manifestation of Lyme disease sometimes. And when patients come and advocate for themselves by reading something on the internet, that may or may not be wrong, right, frankly. Um, the, the doctors tend to be, uh, maybe say, well, well, no, it's probably not Lyme, it's something else. So I think there's a, a frustration that it evolves in the lay, lay people that, um, that, that results in them perhaps not being. Well, Andy, to, to, to build on that, should people have to ask to be retested? Shouldn't this be? It should be, it should be standard of care. And uh, those of us that are in the academic medical community, which I am, spend a great deal of time working with uh, our primary care physicians and others in the healthcare system to try to educate them about not only Lyme disease, but other infectious diseases and how best to test for them, how best to treat for them. Um, but it's an ongoing process. And because there is, as 
Beth pointed out, so much controversy about Lyme. I think some some people just sort of run for cover, and they they're not you know they don't necessarily do the right thing. I don't understand in Brandy's case when I first heard the clip. I don't understand how she could have three positive tests by, and I'm sure it was the EIA assay, and somebody didn't treat her. I mean, I, to me that makes no sense, but. It, you know, but it just shows you how controversial this whole thing is. I mean, I would think if you have a positive test, I mean, the issue with the validated test is that it's not sensitive enough. Well, if, it's, if it goes off positive, don't you think they should treat? Well, yeah, so, so Ben Beard, let's, let's talk a little bit more. There, there is a whole suite of tests that are available. Uh, before our discussion started, actually up on the screen, a, a list popped up of, of half a dozen or more different possible tests, and yet we're still in this situation where we say the tests that we have are not sensitive enough or are not accurate enough. So what, uh, without necessarily going through each and every one of them, why are those the tests that we have? Why don't we have better tests? And are there problems that are addressable with the ones that we do have? <clears throat> well, as I mentioned, the all the tests that are approved right now are serologic tests looking for antibodies. And I think what we have to move toward is a whole new paradigm shift in Lyme disease testing, looking for direct indicators of, of infection. So and, looking for the um, organism mm -hmm. itself in some way as opposed to our body's response to it. it, it right, uh, proteins, the antigens of the, of the Borrelia or markers of human infection or DNA, you know, PCR, which is used. And um, I was told recently by a colleague at um, at FDA that there's not one single PCR assay that's uh, FDA cleared for any tick-borne disease, right. which, is, which is pretty concerning. And, um, and, and of course with Lyme disease, part of the reason why is that uh, detecting Borrelia in peripheral blood is just not predictable, even in synovial in joint fluid, uh, that, that there's a window of opportunity when you catch it, and there are other times when you can't. But all that, so it's, it's not because it's not been looked at, it's just a very challenging uh, issue. So some of the direction that we're taking, I can tell you about two uh, research studies we're doing. One is looking at what we call biomarkers or metab metabolomics, which is um, looking for small uh, metabolic signatures or bi small biochemicals. And we have a large number of patients, some who have early Lyme, some who, who have had late Lyme disease, others who have what we call Lyme disease look-alike conditions, which might be multiple sclerosis or it might be um, you know, other infectious disease illnesses. And looking at these tiny biological signatures, biochemical signatures, to see if any of these are indicators of, of, of Lyme disease infection. And can we see those go up and then go down with treatment? And so we actually have some really, really interesting results, pro promising results, and some papers that are, are actually been submitted for publication right now. And it's still gonna be a long time before those tests come out. There are a lot of others working on those as well. Uh, but that's one approach. Another thing that we're doing that we're really excited about is a large multi-center study and two, one in um, Minnesota with the Minnesota Department of Health and one in Tennessee with the Tennessee Department of Health. So we can take, look in the south, look in the, in the mid, upper Midwest. And uh, the goal is to enroll 30,000 patients over the next three years who come in to the clinic with uh, a tick-borne acute febrile illness, AFI is what we call it for short. So these are patients who come in with a tick bite and then the fe fever after that. And the idea is to work these patients up with PCR, with what we call next generation sequencing, uh, to look to see, uh, do they have Borrelia burgdorferi? Do they have other species of Borrelia? Borrelia miyamotoi, which is another that was recently uh, shown to cause disease in humans. And, um, other, and, and then other illnesses, like Hartman virus, which was a new virus never before seen in the U.S., uh, Powassan or tick, uh, um, deer tick virus. Uh, there are a lot of these tick-borne illnesses. One of the reasons why patients could test negative for Lyme when they have Lyme-like symptoms is that they don't have Lyme, but they have another tick-borne illness, 
with a similar Borrelia that's, that is genetically or antigenically different from Borrelia burgdorferi. So um, you we're investing a, quite a bit in looking at this question in, in depth. And it could well be that there are patients who have these other Borrelia infections, and that's why they're testing negative when they, when they do have an infection, but, but sort of both sides are right. No, you don't have Lyme disease. You know, it's, the test doesn't work. But the flip side is, yes, you do have a tick-borne illness, and it's, it just doesn't quite cross-react. So, you know, we're hoping that thi that might help answer some of these questions about diagnostics. Now, uh, we've heard in recent years that the incidence of ticks that carry more than one disease has gone up. What is that proportion at this point? And not even necessarily different species of this uh, Borrelia bacteria, but completely other Mm -hmm. um, bacterial mm -hmm. diseases that these ticks are carrying, which, as you were pointing out, completely complicate this because you mm -hmm. may go to your, your doctor and say, I had a tick and I don't have a rash and, and I don't have Lyme, mm -hmm. but, but now you've got a whole host yeah. of other things that you might have to, to test for. Well, you know, we know, um, you know, at least three or four disease agents that are transmitted by the same tick, Ixodes scapularis, the deer tick or black-legged tick, and uh, Paramiscus, which is the white-footed mouse, and then they're harbored on deer. So that's Lyme Borrelia. Uh, there's Borrelia miyamotoi, which is another group of spirochetes. There um, is a Poisson virus or deer tick virus, and uh, there's Babesia. And there's even uh, anaplasma. So those agents are all transmitted by ticks. The co-infection rate, which what we mean by that is the fact that one tick might have multiple of these pathogens in them at any given time so that if it bites you, you could have multiple infections. Uh, that varies very much uh, from one location to another. There's a lot, and, and Andy or, or, or Beth might yeah. know more about those rates here in Massachusetts. Yeah. But in general, kind of a national sort of average uh, for nymphal exotic scapularis, about 20% of them are positive, and 40 to 60% of the adults are, are positive. Now for Lyme, for Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, for Miyamotoi, it's more like about 2% of the ticks are positive. But those rates, like I said, vary quite a bit around the area. In, in this area, uh, the number of, uh, of nymphal ticks that are carriers is around 30 to 35 percent. According to the surveillance studies, adults, it's, it's like 70 percent are carrying Lyme. And then probably 30 to 35 percent have dual organisms present. They'll have Lyme, the Lyme uh, bacillus and then something else, uh, anaplasma, babesia, one of the other really nasty things. So uh, dual infections are not uncommon. We, we actually see them occasionally in the hospital. We'll have somebody who's diagnosed with Lyme disease, but oh, by the way, you also have anaplasma. Uh, so it's, it can be co complicated to diagnose as well as complicated to treat. Beth, I wonder if over the few years that you've been following this issue, if you feel that the situation has improved? Is the controversy dying down and treatment becoming more uh, consistent, or is it going in the opposite direction? No, I think actually the controversy is becoming more fierce. I mean, I think there's more common, there's more effort from both sides, the Lyme community and I'd say the medical establishment, because what you really has, let me just say first, is a clash of cultures in many way. You know, the medical establishment is not wrong. I mean, they look at evidence-based medicine. They want to see studies, clinical trials. They want, they want to prove something. And they can't say something exists that they can't actually see and there's evidence for it. I think that's fair to say. But on the other side, you have really bona fide, really, really sick people who are crying for help. And they say, look, we think we have Lyme disease. And they may have Lyme disease. But the medical establishment is not does not see that. They have not been able to see that. So this class of cultures has been uh, pronounced. The common ground over prevention is certainly true. Um, but I think because Lyme disease, um, the, the number of people getting Lyme disease is growing. Well, not growing, but it's um, being reported more accurately now, um, as well as just more people being treated for Lyme that may not have it, frankly. Uh, it's created even more of a clash. I mean, the clash is, I suspect many people here know, is, is, is immense. I mean, the Lyme community has created a parallel medical world in many ways with doctors who are so-called Lyme literate who treat people. Um, and the medical establishment um, does not really recognize that community at all. Um, th the thing that I've noticed that has really become the most pointed for me is the testing issue. In many ways, uh, the FDA test is not at all great, particularly in early stages of the disease. I believe even if you had Lyme disease in your life, 
your body still has those antibodies sort of circulating around, so you still might test positive like five, 10 years later even possibly, right, Ben? Um, but you're, you've had a new infection, so you can't tell, you can't really distinguish between new and previous infections. But what, what has come up really in recent, in recent years is that there's been so many more testing companies that have come on the market through this regulatory loophole, the FDA saying, hey, don't listen to the FDA, their test isn't very good, we can test, we can test you better, and we're right. But the problem with that is, okay, at least the FDA test has published peer-reviewed literature that says, we're not perfect, but here's what we know about this test, you know? But all these other companies I reported on are coming up saying, just trust us. Our, our Lyme disease testing is right, just trust us. And I, I find a hard time trusting anyone that doesn't prov pro provide robust peer review literature that uh, is accepted by the general public, by the scientific community. Sorry, long answer. Andy, <laughs> no, Andy uh, before we came in here, and it, you guys have touched on this, uh, kind of flip side of the issue from someone who may be positive um, in reality and, and not have the testing to prove it not being treated, and the flip side being that uh, in some cases this has gotten to the point where uh, some people believe so fiercely that they have Lyme disease that they may be getting treated for something that they don't have. There are other options. And, and, that's, and that's dangerous, and Ben I think would agree with it. If they don't have an infectious disease. They may have terrible neurologic pain, and, and I know that there are plenty of other things that can cause that besides an, an inflammatory infection. And they get treated with long-term doxycycline or IV ceftriaxone. Well, those drugs are not without some very dangerous potential side effects, including antibiotic-associated colitis and allergic reactions, up, up to and including anaphylaxis. So it's not something you do casually and without, and this is what evidence-based medicine is about. You don't use these things unless you have a reason to believe that that is the right therapy for that patient. And to do otherwise is, is um, dangerous in my opinion. Now, interestingly, doxycycline, which a lot of people want to be on forever, I think, uh, actually has some anti-inflammatory properties. And so they may feel better while they're taking it because they have some sort of an inflammatory inflammation going on, and, and, but as soon as they stop, whatever the is causing inflammation comes back, and so they think that they need to have doxycycline. Well, that's probably not the smartest thing in the world to be doing. I wanna go back to the clash of cultures that you mentioned, Beth, and, and Andy, I wonder your perspective as uh, a biomedical researcher. There is this, this culture within science and within medicine of, of wanting the evidence there. And when that evidence is presented in the form of, of someone telling you your personal story, that can often be discounted. But at some point, many people's personal stories have to start to add up to pointing out that something in our scientific or medical understanding is not matching reality. Do you think that the, the medical and the scientific community was too slow to make that realization that there was a lack of understanding? Has that realization even happened um, on a broad scale? Well, I, th I think Lyme disease has, has certainly triggered uh, uh, some very emotional responses from people who believe they have it or, or do have it and it hasn't been diagnosed and people who think they have it and may or may not have it. The issue, as Beth pointed out, is the testing. Now, Pretty, if somebody thinks they have a better test for Lyme disease, it's pretty straightforward as to how you do it. You run your test in parallel with the existing methods and show that they at least match up. And then maybe your method's detecting some things that the earlier methods don't, but you at least match what the existing methods do. When somebody ref you know, refuses to do that and says, well, trust me, you know, my, te my test is really cool, it's good, and you can believe me, that's not evidence-based medicine. I mean, that's somebody that's out to make a buck off of somebody because they don't want to spend the time and the money that it takes to do, uh, you know, a legitimate clinical trial the way they're supposed to be done. And to me as a scientist, you know, that's, that's not ethical and it's not the right approach to, you know, improving the quality of care. I mean, we're all, scientists, we're about making healthcare better and making better tests. But you know, we, we have to follow a set of rules in order to do this properly, and, and if we don't do that, and somebody it bypasses that, then they may be doing more harm than good, and that's what concerns me, and that's, quite frankly, one of the only reasons that I'm here tonight, is to talk about that. All right, 
Now, I haven't uh, noticed any tweets coming in, but I, and I do want to give you guys your shot at, at questions if you've been, been writing those down. Um, I'm going to ask Ben one more question while we, we make sure that we have everybody's uh, questions, questions in. Ben, I, we, we alluded earlier to uh, your <coughs> other hat that you wear for the CDC with regard to climate change and the fact that those two do overlap. There has been a spread in ticks infected carrying the, the Lyme organism, both north and south. How much of a factor is climate change and what are some of the other factors in that spread? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> with Lyme disease, I, I think of Lyme disease, and I work very closely with our CDC equivalent in Canada, Public Health Agency of Canada, where Lyme disease has recently been introduced and is, uh, is spreading there. Um, Lyme disease in the U.S., I would characterize it as being more of a re-emerging disease rather than just simply an emerging disease. And uh, there are a lot of historical uh, records and evidence that Lyme disease you know, was here through much of the Northeast and, and even as, you know, out in California, and that um, with the um, uh, agricultural days, you know, the 1700s and 1800s, you know, uh, here in Massachusetts, and I actually have a really nice slide of this in presentations showing land use that, you know, it was like 80 or 90 percent cultivated in the early, in around the turn of the century, or 1800s, and then over the last 100 years plus, you know, we, we've had reforestation of these areas, and so kind of the prevailing view on Lyme disease is that it's been re-emerging from what we call refugia, or refuge, refuges in the deer population as it's expanded, uh, the tick has recovered, and then the Borrelia that's persisted in the small mice and things has gradually spread with that. So, um, you know, clearly climate change is driving some part of the northward expansion of Lyme disease because in areas in Canada, the tick can't survive off the host through the harsh winters. Well, now it can in some of these areas. Uh, we also see that, that because of the um, the seasons being milder, that uh, maybe more of the ticks here in these areas uh, go to adulthood, so you have larger population densities, which could add into the risk of Lyme disease transmission. <coughs> but uh, the geographic distribution probably is less affected as the seasonal occurrence. And the studies we've been looking at showing that, that with <laughs> over the last 15 years, we've had Lyme transmission being pushed up season. So you have it or, or earlier in the year, and we're seeing a trend for this, uh, and that's probably more um, remarkable than the geographic distribution in terms of climate change. But, uh, but clearly it's, it's figuring into it, and um, you know, we're concerned about that. But the, but the thing I like to say, though, about climate change is that um, whether there's climate change or not, we have a huge Lyme disease problem. And, um, and for those of you who don't embrace climate change, you know, what we would do, or for those of you who do, what we would do for Lyme disease 40 years from now is the same thing we need to be doing for Lyme disease right now. We've got to prevent it. And so th that is, is the focus from my point of view. Given that... Uh, we are likely to see an increasing spread of this. Uh, we mentioned a little bit uh, earlier the, the need for more preventive measures, but there was a, an interesting question from, uh, from an audience member. Is it possible to be immune to Lyme disease or to develop an immunity to Lyme disease? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a good question, and I think, I um, can't remember if it was Andy or, or Beth that mentioned um, that um, if you, I, I think both of you actually, that um, once you've had Lyme disease, that you can have uh, detectable antibodies for quite a few years after that. Now, those antibody responses tapered off, and we have a few series, a case series where we've looked at this. But um, the protective immunity doesn't last very long. And, and I think Andy was sharing the, uh, that, that you have family members who've had more than one Lyme yeah, disease infections. Yeah. And so that itself is evidence that you, you don't build lifelong immunity. Now, th there was a vaccine that was pulled from the market in 2002. And um, the vaccine um, would be administered three times over a course of a year with boosters, and then after that, you would get a seasonal booster at the beginning of the season. That vaccine was pulled, but that did give, you know, pretty robust protection, but it mean, meant that every year, you have to get a booster for that. So. Now, Beth, you mentioned a regulatory loophole earlier with regard to testing, and, and one audience member was wondering if you could explain that a little bit more, and, and I, I, 
along those lines, wonder with the alternative tests that are available, uh, what kind of choices doctors have to make? I mean, if they have yes. some that are, are approved tests, but others that claim to be, to be better, where does this leave doctors trying to figure out the best tool for trying to diagnose their patients? Yeah. So th this is a big problem, and it's not just a Lyme disease problem. A um, long time ago, when FDA began regulating diagnostic tests in 1976, they excluded a very, what was then a very small subset of tests that were mostly done in labs and hospitals by experts. There were variations on common tests. They were low risk. Um, they were for really rare diseases that a, a proper diagnostic test can be validated. Um, but what's happened really just in the last decade, I'd say, 2002, um, a lot with the sequencing of the human genome, is that you have all these uh, tests coming onto the market. There's now something like FDA estimates 11,000 tests by 2,000 labs that basically operate right next to FDA approved and cleared tests, but they don't have to get any, they don't have to prove that the test actually does what it promises to. And it's very getting very hard for doctors and healthcare professionals to distinguish between the two. Now, Lyme disease tests, I would argue, most medical establishment doctors I know, meeting most doctors you go to, will not recommend that you go to these labs that I recently wrote about, these um, very suspect labs, to be honest with you. Um, they will go through the FDA-approved lab because it's, it's so well established. It's been around for such a long time. Um, some Lyme literate doctors who will diagnose Lyme disease will use these other tests occasionally, um, but that's sort of outside the medical establishment. So, but I think it can be hard, in, including, you know, doctors who really care to treat patients for Lyme disease, they will look at these new tests coming onto the market and try to evaluate them, and I know they struggle with that. Um, but yeah, it's very, very challenging. The FDA just today announced actually draft regulations to start regulating these group of tests, but it's going to take a decade and it may be blocked because um, there's such a political backlash against it. I want to let you know, I'm, I'm, you can see Sorry. me reading through questions here. I'm paraphrasing a few and combining a few because we have so many and uh, limited time. So uh, a couple of, of questions here, mashing a few together. When was Lyme first detected and how, if at all, was Lyme uh, treated before we had tests like antibody tests? How was it diagnosed and treated uh, prior to the, the advent of those tests, or was it? I would enjoy hearing well, your take on that. <laughs> well, Lyme disease is named after a phenomenon that occurred in Lyme, Connecticut. I'm, I'm from Glastonbury, Connecticut originally. And what was noticed back in the uh, mid to late 70s were uh, in certain neighborhoods that lots of children developed something that was called juvenile arthritis. And it was really the moms in the neighborhood, I think, who were instrumental in pushing this forward because, you know, it was a it's a relatively rare the juvenile arthritis is a relatively rare disease, and they're going, well, we got four cases in our neighborhood. What's going on here? And so they uh, were fortunate enough to you know make enough noise to attract the attention of a then I think fellow ID fellow named Alan Steer, who was able to put this together and then work with some very good um, people that dealt with ticks and tick-borne diseases because he sort of suspected it might be this. And that was where the actual link between this symptoms in children and the tick-borne disease was made. And it wasn't until later that we realized how widespread this was. Now, I don't know. I, I suspect they probably tried a bunch of different antibiotics until they found that tetracycline or doxycycline work, but I, I can't comment on that because I don't know. Um, but we found out in the early 80s that this was a pretty widespread disease, and part of that was based on the studies that we did at Tufts when I was at the veterinary school, and in fact, when we developed one of these first EIAs to look at dogs, because they scan a lot of area, and we figured, wow, if there's tick-borne diseases out there, the dogs We'll certainly pick it up faster than we can pick it up from humans. And by the way, it's pretty easy to collect the uh, heartworm sera from the local vets and, and do the testing on it. And that was when they just found out that the prevalence of this disease in New England was huge. And then, of course, as it gained more notoriety and more people's adults started to develop it and they started to standardize 
you know, the, the diagnosis and the symptoms and the treatment, uh, you know, sort of took on a life of its own. I think the first commercially available EIAs for human disease were developed in the late 80s, you know, followed by the more uh, uh, sophisticated Western blot assays in the early 90s. And I think that that's pretty much, that. I'm probably off a few years on the time frame, but that's pretty much how it developed. Really interesting about that. Um, there's a, a. It really was a group of mothers. It was a really amazing time, actually, to to, develop, to discover this new disease. I mean, that doesn't happen very often. Moms are a very <laughs> important part they, of medicine. They really were. Polly Murray, and there, there was another mom. Anyway, but the but but what's interesting is I actually got in touch with the first group of kids who got died. These group of kids, and um, one family is called the Murray family, and I. Turns out one of the kids who is most affected is now a doctor, went to Columbia Medical School and, and still has lingering symptoms from Lyme and, and it struggles with it a great deal. But what was interesting back then, all they did, they gave him aspirin, you know. They didn't, they didn't know what it was. There was a belief it was viral, I believe, early mm -hmm. on. And so there was a really, there was no, there was no um, a, a cure. But what was interesting is that a lot of people didn't, talk about these long-term effects that they do now, which I thought was very interesting back then. You didn't see this sort of like, you know, people having it for years. Lyme but, but they didn't know. So, they yeah, didn't know yeah. back then. Yeah. I mean, I had, just anecdotally, yeah, we had a point. family friend who, in, in outside of Glastonbury, who acquired Lyme disease before they knew what it was, and she ended up being wheelchair-bound for 35 years before she finally passed away. I mean, she had severe Lyme disease, which, and, and had it and was untreated for so long that the symptoms that she had were debilitating and could not be treated. So uh, I don't think we really knew what it was. And, but, you know, obviously we didn't know what the long-term effects were until we knew what it was we were dealing with, but now I think we do. So Ben Beard, our, our understanding of Lyme appears to still be rapidly evolving, uh, you know, from something that we thought was just an acute infection to something that appears to have, in many cases, long-term neurological impacts, as you were mentioning. Uh, the fact that it now appears that Lyme can actually cause acute uh, carditis, can cause a, a heart problem that can be fatal. Um, do you think that the CDC's uh, recommendations with regard to testing and treating this disease are in line with what we currently understand, or are they perhaps due for a, a little bit of an update? Um. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll back up by saying you know, I've been at CDC 23 years, and the first 12 years of those, I was uh, working in international health and tropical medicine, and I was kind of used to CDC, the banner, you know, and I'm at CDC, and everyone kind of clapped. And when I took this job with Lyme disease, I, I, uh, the, the, the uh, perception changed quite a bit, and uh, <laughs> that's been interesting. I've been there for the last 11 years with, you know, with Lyme. And, um, I think that we, we've seen, the promising thing is that in the last year or two probably, in my opinion, we've seen more movement on the Lyme disease front than certainly in the last 15 years together. And um, some of the things that we've seen include these carditis cases. I mean, that's very alarming. And to answer your question directly, it calls for real vigilance among healthcare providers. And if a person comes in with any signs or symptoms of cardiac illness, shortness of breath, dizziness, and it's in the tick transmission season, um, should be very concerned about that and be very aggressive and, and looking, you know, and ruling out Lyme disease. And, and the same way for people who have had tick bites or live in areas of risk. I mean, you can't take that lightly. And, um, but, but some of the other changes we've seen is this plethora of, of new novel tick-borne disease agents like Borrelia miyamotoi, heartland virus infection, um, you know, and a number of other Borrelia we've seen in ticks that we think may be contributing to human disease. And then the whole studies, all the studies have been done on persistence. And we did a webinar, and you can see this at our website if you're interested, and it's looking at persistent studies in mice, persistent studies in non-human primates, and even in humans, some of the work that's being done at, here at Tufts and NIH, uh, kind of opening up this question of what's really going on 
with this. And, and you know, in many ways, the jury is still out on that. Detecting DNA doesn't equate to detecting live uh, infectious organisms. But, you, you know, as both Beth and Andy um, mentioned, you know, for us to come out with guidance, we have to depend on evidence-based medicine. And, and, you know, is it possible to have evidence, true evidence, <coughs> double-blinded placebo-controlled trials for every medical recommendation there is? You know, that, that's a challenge. And I understand that, it's, it's hugely expensive. But um, as was alluded to, there are risks. Antibiotics are powerful drugs and we've seen deaths due to um, uh, Clostridium difficile colitis on one month of oral doxycycline. And so those are not a walk in the park. And we've also seen uh, uh, case studies that we've collected of patients who've been treated for chronic Lyme disease when they have uh, ca various cancers and uh, other, other lymphomas and illnesses, and that's, that's quite concerning. And uh, ALS, and um, so we really, um, we want the best diagnosis and the best treatment for patients, and there's a lot of research that needs to, to go on. But I think there's is a very fast changing landscape right now, and I, for one, am, am, um, am uh, optimistic that, that there are gonna be enough information for, for new tests and new guidance and things like that. But it's, it's, it's to me, understanding the cause or causes of persistent symptoms in patients that have been treated for Lyme disease, but they have these, these persistent symptoms, and understanding what are the safest and most effective treatments for these patients is, is one of the most, it is the most important issue, second most, next to prevention, <laughs> in uh, yeah. facing the field of Lyme disease. Well, I think you've kind of answered what, why my last question was going to be for you. So, Andy Onderdonk, I'm going to move on to you. What uh, would be your message to anyone who thinks that they may be suffering from Lyme disease? What is your advice to them? My advice is to be tested with the currently available validated assays. If they're negative, to request that you be tested again. And if those tests continue to be negative, then I, th I think you need to consider an alternative diagnosis to Lyme disease, but to not necessarily seek treatment for something you don't have. Beth, I wonder if you could leave us perhaps with one thing in this story that at this point gives you hope. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, you, know, you know, actually, it's pretty amazing that, I mean, Lyme disease is actually a really serious issue. I, I don't, my um, husband's cousin's wife, Andrea, I don't know if she really ever had Lyme disease. I really don't. But the fact is that are people advocating for themselves and going out there and saying, look, like, we're sick and we need to, we need to be heard. I, I think the, the, and I think that actually gives me hope because um, the patient community, while I think it can be a sort of a thorn in the side of the medical establishment, it is a very powerful group of people. And it's clear these, there's a group of people who are, who are really, really sick. And they're sort of needling medical establishment saying, hey, don't tell us anymore that you don't know what we have and dismiss us over here to go talk to psychiatrists. You have to take us seriously and try to figure out what's going on. And I think that's hopeful. And the Lyme community, um, which involves lots of different kinds of people, I would argue, with Lyme, without Lyme, and may have other things, as Ben alluded to, are really uh, pushing forward and growing to become a real voice. And that will, money will follow in research. So there, all right. Well, I think um, we'll move on to the next part of our program. There are clearly more questions, and our panelists will be available to chat with you uh, as we, we move out into the atrium. But uh, Beth Daly, Andy Onderdonk, and, and, uh, and Ben, thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you, Heather. You did a terrific job. Thank you, all of our guests and panelists, noted journalists and distinguished experts. So through the last hour, we've had some Twitter activity. Uh, we wanted to thank Angie, Nancy, Phil, Lisa. Kathleen was tweeting from the Pacific Northwest. She got onto this. And somebody from um, England was also tweeting about this. So it just shows you the not just the power of the media, but also the power of this really important subject for people to find this on a Tuesday night. Uh, it's one in the morning in London, I think, or whatever. <laughs> so uh, some takeaways. We've got a show on WGBH. You listen to it twice a day probably at 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon, right? The takeaway? John Hockenberry? Right. So my takeaways from this, uh, I, I was shocked 
when you started this, Heather, by asking people by a show of hands how many people have had Lyme disease or have had a family member. I don't know why I was shocked. Maybe the, the, the room is stacked with people who are really passionate about this on a school night, but I was shocked that almost everybody raised their hand. Uh, get tested, get retested. It's probably not news to everybody, but just to hear the experts say that, it just shows how simple it is, but also how confusing it is to the patients. The medical establishment doesn't recognize the Lyme community at all, was a, a pretty big takeaway for me. And also the new tests, they need to be compared with the existing tests. When someone refuses, that's not evidence-based medicine. Someone's looking to make a buck. Uh, one other takeaway, that email that I had read at the beginning of a family member, uh, not that he had hope, but he at least was looking for the next day. He ended that email to me two years ago. That's it for now. I'll keep you guys posted. I doubt the doctor will be able to diagnose until the blood test results come back, if even then. From the literature I have found, it appears that diagnosing these symptoms is very difficult, one step at a time. So, uh, you know, a lot of you have gone through this. Uh, it was something to hear the panel talk about their own personal experiences of joints and fatigue and things like that. So I think I have an email or a phone call to make to my uh, family member on that. I uh, want to thank the New England Center for Investigative Reporting, Joe, and your team. It's just terrific, just a hand for this event. <laughs> really, we couldn't do this event without the partnership we have with great organizations like Joe's. Uh, also, we couldn't do this event without the sustaining giving members that, uh, the sustained giving members that we have at WGBH. I know Joe, as you, he had mentioned, also rely on uh, um, partnerships, but also support from the public at large. Uh, and you know that in this day and age where the media, the mainstream media is just doing eight second sound bites, to have depth and perspective of your organization, and hopefully we aspire to that in this building also, we really thank you all uh, for your support. Uh, we're offering tours of WGBH. If you want to go out, uh, you'll see an usher just uh, mention that. And before you depart, we encourage you to fill out a survey of what you thought of this event. You'll be entered into a drawing for free tickets to a WGBH event. Uh, it's called WGBH, oh, it's the Taste of WGBH Cider. And everybody watching online is going to be really jealous that they can't uh, sign up for that. Again, um, online, this will be online uh, tomorrow on both NECIR and WGBHnews.org. So you, we encourage you not just to watch it, uh, but to share it with people who wouldn't, weren't able to make it here tonight, uh, or you think that'll be really, really interested in this topic. Uh, thank you again, Andrew and Charles. Heather, you're gonna be on WGBH radio beginning maybe at 7.20 tomorrow or 8.20? Uh, Thursday. Thursday. 7.20 Thursday. Thursday. She's going to take over the airway of 7.20 in the morning. <laughs> She's going to be on with Jim and Marjorie sometime between 11 and 2. And then you're going to be on Greater Boston with Emily Rooney at 7 p.m. on TV. So the multimedia aspect, <laughs> and I'm sure you're blogging about something on this. And Beth, we know from your passion, this story is not going away. Uh, we know that um, really um, the Lyme disease community, if I can call it that, is grateful to you and everything all of your passion and your dedication to this topic, along with every other topic that you cover. We're lucky to have you in this building at WGBH also, so I wanted uh, to thank you for that. Uh, what else? Other things, I think that's it. Uh, there is a reception outside. You can meet the panelists. Uh, you can talk with them, mingle amongst yourselves. I want to thank you for spending a school night with us for the last hour and a half or so, and uh, keep watching, keep listening, keep reading. Uh, we will stay on top of this topic, so thank you. <laughs>